In this video, we're going to cover S1 reactions, particularly those associated with carbocation rearrangements. We're going to talk about the hydride shift and the methyl shift. So let's consider this reaction. We have a secondary alkyl halide. The carbon that bears the bromine is attached to two other carbon atoms. So that's why it's secondary. And we have a protic solvent, H2O. So the mechanism for this particular example is going to be the SN1 reaction. First order nucleophilic substitution. What's going to be the product, or rather the major S1 product for this reaction? For an S1 reaction, the first step that's going to happen is the leaving group is going to leave. When carbon loses a bond, it's going to acquire a positive charge. And so what we have here is a secondary carbocation. Now, how do you know whether or not a carbocation will undergo rearrangement? The key is stability. If the carbocation can restructure itself in such a way to form a more stable state, it's going to do that. Notice that the carbocation is adjacent to a tertiary carbon. When you see that, you're going to get a carbocation rearrangement, particularly a hydride shift. A hydrogen on a tertiary carbon is going to move to the carbocation. And here is that hydrogen now. Now this carbon lost the bond, so it's going to carry a positive charge. So now we have a tertiary carbocation as opposed to a secondary carbocation. And the reason why this rearrangement occurs is due to an increase in stability. By moving the hydrogen from this position to that position, the carbocation becomes more stable. So it's going to do that. It wants to adopt the most stable configuration possible that it can find. So that's the driving force for a rearrangement reaction, its stability. So now that we have this tertiary carbocation, what's going to happen? Once we form this carbocation, it's going to react with the solvent. When the solvent behaves as a nucleophile, what you have is a solvolysis reaction. The nucleophile is going to combine with the carbocation, giving us an oxonium ion. Which looks like this. Now, in the next step, another water molecule is going to come to remove a proton. And the end result is that we're going to get a tertiary alcohol, particularly 2-methyl, two 2-butanol. Two so that's going to be the major product for this particular example. So make sure you understand this. If you have a secondary carbocation, next to a tertiary carbon, you're going to get a hydride shift. Now, let's say instead of a hydrogen that we had a methyl group. This will be a quaternary carbon. In this case, we can't get a hydride shift from that quaternary carbon, but what we can get is a methyl shift. So that's when they will occur. Whenever you have a secondary carbocation, next to a quaternary carbon, you're going to get a methyl shift. Or if you have a primary carbocation next to a quaternary carbon, that too can create a methyl shift as well. Now, let's try another example. So here we have 2-bromo, 3,3-dimethyl, pentane. This time, we're going to react it with methanol as opposed to water. So feel free to pause the video and try this example. Determine the major mechanism, I mean, determine the reaction mechanism, the major product, and write out the entire mechanism for this example. So this is going to be an S1 reaction. We have a protic solvent, 
and a secondary alkyl halide. By the way, for those of you who want to know how to determine if you're going to have an SN1, SN2, E1, or E2 reaction, if you're not sure how to figure that out, there's a video that I have on YouTube. If you go to the YouTube search bar and type in SN1, SN2, E1, E2 reaction mechanisms, organic chemistry tutor, it's going to show up in the search results. And it's going to give you a table that will help you determine what type of mechanism you're going to have if you know the substrate. In this case, it's a secondary alkyl halide. If you know what kind of solvent you're dealing with and what type of nucleophile you have. But protic solvents favor SN1 reactions over SN2 reactions. SN2 reactions work better in polar aprotic solvents. Now, in this example, because we have an SN1 reaction, the leaving group is going to leave. And so we're going to get a secondary carbocation. Now, this secondary carbocation is adjacent to a quaternary carbon. So in this example, we are going to get a methyl shift. This methyl group is going to glide to this carbocation. And so the entire carbon structure of this molecule is going to change. So here's the new methyl group. And this carbon lost the bond. It lost the methyl group. So it's going to have the positive charge. So what we now have is a tertiary carbocation. Tertiary carbocations are more stable than secondary carbocations due to hyperconjugation and the inductive effect. So now that we have this, what's going to happen? What's our next step? Once we completed all possible rearrangements, the next thing we can do is combine the carbocation with the nucleophile. So in this case, the solvent is a nucleophile, which means that this reaction is also a solvolysis reaction. And we're going to get this. Now, whenever hydrogen is attached to a positively charged oxygen atom, that hydrogen is highly acidic. So methanol, it's going to behave as a weak base, and it's going to abstract a proton. And I forgot this methyl group. So the final result is that we're going to get an ether as the major product instead of an alcohol. So whenever you use water as a nucleophile, and if you react it with an alkyl halide, water is going to give you an alcohol. But if you use an alcohol, you're going to get an ether. So that's it for this video. So remember, if you have a secondary carbocation adjacent to a tertiary carbon, you're going to get a hydride shift. And if you have a secondary carbocation adjacent to a quaternary carbon, you're going to get a methyl shift. Now the next type of carbocation rearrangement that you need to be familiar with is the ring expansion. Now for those of you who are interested in downloading that practice test, here's how you can do it. So if you go to patreon.com slash math science tutor, it'll take you to my Patreon membership page. Now to really to get this particular worksheet, you need the level four membership. This is where I have my worksheets for final exams and practice tests. Once you sign in, you'll see something that looks like this. And if you go to organic chemistry posts, you're going to get access to the extended versions of my organic chemistry videos. 
you've seen the free versions which could be for a typical video like 20 minutes long the full versions could be an hour or two hours long some are even like four hours long but you could find the links to the the direct link to the extended version of my YouTube videos in the description section of the referring video on YouTube So if you're taking um, your second exam, and if you're studying SN1, SN2, E1, E2 reactions, I recommend viewing this one. I think the free version is like 30 minutes long on YouTube, somewhere around there. The full version is an hour and a half long. This will give you a good overview of SN1, SN2 reactions. But here's the practice test that you can download. It has 77 test questions, and <laughs> I've put as many variations of problems that you might find on a typical exam for this topic in this particular document. Now this is the video that has all of these questions but has the answers as well. But for those of you who prefer to get a printout and maybe work on this while you're at school or something, you can check this out when you get a chance. So you need the level 4 membership to get this document but the level 3 membership to access this video. So feel free to take a look at that when you have a moment.